Hi everyone, this is the Do3 Podcast. This is for anyone who loves swimming, cycling or running, or of course, likes to do all three. My name is Dave Knight and I'm a professional triathlon coach based in the UK. Along with my excellent co-coaches, who you'll get to know along the way, we spend our daily lives helping those who love to swim, bike and run. We want this podcast to inspire you, motivate you, make you laugh and cry, have fun and learn a thing or two. We want to help you get the most out of the sports that you love. I'm glad you found us and we hope you stick around. Welcome to the Do3 Podcast. Welcome to episode nine of the Do Three podcast. Now it's been a while since our last podcast, so sorry to those who have been patiently waiting. Now we're back today with a great episode where we chat to TV doctor Hussein Al Zubaydi. Now he's a lifestyle and longevity doctor and coach, and he's a passion for using lifestyle to improve health. Now we discussed a range of topics from training and triathlon to general health and fitness, and even touched on the menopause, both female and male. So listen out for that. So this episode is a must listen for anyone interested in improving their health and performance through lifestyle changes. So whether you're a triathlete or just someone looking to live a healthier life. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please subscribe. You good? You're used to all this. I'm not, you're much more used to it than I am. Uh, Right, we can actually say I'm being attacked by the fan. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, Today's podcast, we have Dr. Hussein al Zabedi. Um, and we are going to be talking to you about all sorts of stuff, really. Lots and lots. Uh, generally training, triathlon, general health and fitness, a um, bit about menopause, male and female, and anything else that comes up. So let's, uh, let's go for it. Do you want to start by introducing yourself? Yeah. My name is Sane Alzebedi. I'm a lifestyle doctor and a really keen passion for the use of lifestyle to improve our health. And mm-hmm. some may have not heard of a lifestyle doctor before, but essentially we are medically trained in exactly the same way. I am trained as the general practitioner, but we do additional qualification in lifestyle medicine, which is essentially got some core pillars where we try to maximize physical activity, minimize harmful substances like alcohol, smoking, etc use or the power that community and connection has uh, with each and every one of us things like nutrition so it's just trying to do the things in our own lifestyle that many of us kind of know the right and wrongs but just to hone that to try to get maximum amount of quality of health from your lifestyle okay is that through your gp because you're a gp aren't you is that through your gp practice or are you doing that in other kind of other places i'm doing it in a few different ways. So yeah, in the GP practice that I work at in Leamington, we run, for example, group lifestyle clinics where we'll have discussions with patients, supporting them in those key pillars. But also, we I spend a lot of time working with organizations like Swim England to support them get, for example, patients with long-term health conditions, assessing the water. I work with the Royal College of GP, so I'm the physical activity and lifestyle lead. So there we try to create initiatives to improve knowledge and understanding in the health force. Because you may think that healthcare surely knows what the right lifestyle is. Well, actually, it's not the case. There isn't much training or teaching within medical school or into the day-to-day job on those things. And it's really important that we should because people often come to us yeah. with those very questions. So, yes, yeah, so I work in a number of different areas. I've got quite a wide portfolio, but the, the key thread that runs through it is just trying to support people on their journey to make more but significant steps to improve their health. And do you find what a bit of a wide question? And uh, well, obviously, we're here generally to talk about triathlon, but this is kind of going to go off on a bit of a, a general route here. But what would you say about the, 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 the overall health of the, the nation, yeah. if you like? Because in our world, we spend all our time dealing with athletes and people who do swimming, cycling, and running, and they're generally compared to the normal person, I'd guess they're pretty damn fit. What would you say the normal person is actually like in reality? Yeah. You definitely see a very uh, small subset yeah. uh, of motivated and and, yeah. and active individuals, which is fantastic. Generally, things are not good. You know, 
one of the main reasons, and I often think it's not talked about enough, that our healthcare system is struggling and many westernized healthcare systems are struggling is because there's been a massive increase in what we call morbidity, and that's just a term given for people with symptoms that reduce the quality of life. The diagnosis of long-term health conditions, things like type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, obesity, those numbers have shot up. So, for example, men in the UK, 72% of them are either overweight or obese. 72%. That means coming into my clinic, I'm more likely to see someone that's overweight than a healthy way. You know, that that's that's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. That's huge. And it's meaning that for the first time ever, our life expectancy actually dropping. Okay. So for the past hundred years we've been through plenty of technology, slowly increasing that life expectancy. For the past years now it's it's dropped. And a huge amount of that is due to poor lifestyles. You know, the WHO has Estimated, because it can only be an estimate when it's looking at population health, that 60% of all the illnesses suffered in westernized countries like the UK are avoidable. So it's not written in stone. It's not just inevitable. These are avoidable conditions. It's such a shame. It's such a shame that that's the case, because I think many people don't realize that they have a lot more power than the things they do day to day to... Be reduce the chances of getting those conditions, live longer, healthier. And I often use the phrase live longer, better, because I think many of us care whether we are 85 or 75, etc. But I think we want to have as many years as possible with good quality health, to yeah. be able to do the things we love, to be able to yeah. still enjoy life. Often I see, in particular on the front line when I'm going to home visits, I see patients that struggle with frailty for a long period of time, maybe the last 10 years of their life. Yeah. That's where lifestyle can play a massive role. Yeah. And even your group, as a triathletes that are coming in, there's always more you can do. And it's not because we're trying to burden you with responsibility. No, it's often triathletes have that mindset of constantly wanting to improve. And I find that when I do sessions with athletes, when I do sessions with motivated individuals, it's often a lot easier to get bigger strides forwards. It's all things you can improve in your nutrition, things you can improve with your stress levels and emotional health, you know, even things you can improve with your physical activity to make sure you get that balance of rest and strength and, and yeah. all the different components to, yeah. to get that those marginal gains. Which, yeah, you know, you know more than eight. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean. We spend a lot of time. Yeah, we've got our, our our group are really generally highly motivated, but the actual level of knowledge is fairly low. Yeah, and when we're looking at the as triathletes as a as a as a whole, there's a there's a there's a group who are really kind of dialed in, know exactly what they're doing, but the, the knowledge level generally is quite low. They know they have to swim, cycle, and run, and they have to kind of vary the intensity a bit. But in terms of how hard, the how long, the amount of rest, the food. Um, the the knowledge levels are great. It make a huge difference. People yeah. think that these things are any small changes, but yeah. when you apply them consistently, very different results. Very different results. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's interesting because I um, one of the reasons I was interested in speaking to you in terms of um, kind of health, health and mental well well being, I guess, um, going forward through life is I've I was discussing it with you earlier. I've just I've just turned fifty one. I feel like I'm starting to get on a bit and I'm, I must admit, I'm starting to feel it. I mean, I started to feel it. I think when I turned 50, it was like a, I felt like I literally went over the hill. <laughs> it sounds awful. Um, but I've really noticed because that's coincided with being very busy at work and spending a lot of time coaching and not so much time actually training myself anymore that I'm putting a little bit of weight on and finding it, I'm nowhere near as fit as I used to be and I'd like to be, and I'm starting to worry, and I know it's the same with other athletes and other other uh, individuals that I speak to, the worry is there that if you let that conditioning go too far for too long, once you're at or above a certain age, it, it it's going to be difficult to pull it back. So I'm kind of in panic mode a little bit at the moment. So what do you think, what do you think I could do to, I mean, I guess it's difficult for you to answer because you don't know what kind of training and things that I do. But what's the what's the obvious thing that I can do to try and uh, sort that out? Would it be kind of can just get back in consistency? Would it be get a grip of the diet? You know, what would kind of what kind of advice would you give? 
for someone like me. When we see decline due to aging, a lot of it is not due to the physiological changes that happen with aging. Yeah. For sure, that occurs, and there are small drops as time goes on. We hit the nail on the head. It's often situations that come about, whether it be an injury, whether it be a change in situation at work, something that knocks you off your conditioning, that knocks you off your current plan. And absolutely, when you are 50 compared to when you were 20, the rate at which you lose muscle mass yeah. is much faster. The, not only mass, but functionality of the muscles. We see that there's a much more rapid drop when uh, patients are older and they stop stimulating them. For example, go to the hospital in the 70s. For just two days, they will lose 25% of the muscle power functioning. 25% wow. in that's two amazing. days. Yeah. And that's why we're always so nervous about hospitalizing patients. Because we know that, yes, we may be able to do this in the hospital and do that. But as a physical body, they are just going to waste away in front of your eyes. The way that we treat people in hospital, they're in beds, they're told not to get out of bed because we're worried they're going to fall and then they're going to end up suing the hospital. And so, like, they're sort of kept in these kind of cocoons, yeah. which is even worse. So, a really important aspect for any age, I'd say above 40, you need to sure that you don't have these blips for too long. It's totally fine. These things happen, stresses in life occur. But as soon as you can, you need to get back onto doing something. And it may be that, let's say you couldn't get your one hour workout in because of time, etc. Mm. Even five minutes, even 10 minutes, just the whole stimulation, sending the signals to those muscles will just tell your body that, oh, okay, I, oh, we still need it. Because your body's super efficient. If it doesn't think it needs a certain muscle group at the intensity and strength and conditioning that it is, it will switch that off. Yeah. Got other things to do. And you have to understand how our kind of body is designed. It's lived most of the last 200,000 years with food scarcity and, and low survivability. Mm. So it is constantly geared on trying to make you feel as efficient as possible. So if you can sit still and do as little as possible and, and just be in your bum, it will encourage you to do that. And if you can eat calorie-dense foods, it will encourage you to do that, especially when you're stressed. People may notice that they just yearn yeah, sugary foods, family foods, particular at times of stress. Mm. And it's all because it wants to store, it wants to make sure that it can survive a harsh winter, it can survive famine, etc. So we have to understand that's how our brain is geared to take measures to kind of combat that. Mm. Fortunately, with the environment we have now, food what isn't scarce. Um, Technology has removed out a lot of physical activity that used to just be you had to do, whether it be the washing machine, which now does your clothes, the dishwasher does your plates, the car moves you around, the robot mower and boover does all the manual jobs. So now we have to find time, isn't it? Well, before, whether you liked it or not, you had to move. And, and these kind of bits is what means that aging accelerates in Western countries, but not so much if we look, for example, in Sardinia. So in Sardinia, it's a very mountainous area, and it's a relatively poor area. People still do these things by hand, whether it be washing the clothes, whether it be making pasta every day, whether it be um, walking up these ridiculously steep streets. There's actually a really interesting study that showed that the older people that lived on the steeper streets led healthier lives. It was just because, not because they were going out and doing hill training, but it's going out and having to do hill training every day to go to the post office and go to the brand. Yeah. So I think that's the challenge that we have because very easily things can sort of become very busy in your life. The westernized lifestyle will just lead to overconsumption, lack of movement, as you'll, you'll see deconditioning just much quicker at this age than you will when you probably would have been able to tolerate it maybe in your 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Uh, so you said 25% of no, yeah, this is cool. yeah. Uh, functional strength. Yeah, functional strength in two days. That's incredible. Hospitalized. So At seven, around 70 and above. And of course, it won't be as severe with your case, but that's just making a point that, you know, you can lose it really quickly. Yeah, sure. At the rate at which you gain it as well, that's something that is kind of against you as you get older. You have to work yeah. harder 
to get those same results. But it doesn't mean you can't get the results. Some incredible athletes well into their 70s and 80s. Yeah. You just have to put in more time. And there's a, there's a really incredible doctor called Samuel Gray. He's a leading expert. He's in his 70s himself. And he always says that if you find something hard as you get older, you just have to train harder. And then if you find it harder again, you have to train even harder. And we just have to keep training harder and harder, smarter and smarter for as long as possible. You yeah. have to enjoy that process. If you enjoy that process, yeah. you're more likely going to keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, again, when I was, when I was a teenager, I used to look at my, my grandparents and they'd be, they'd be, I think they were maybe in their late 50s, early 60s then, and I thought they were absolutely ancient. Yeah. And they would sit in their chair you know, my granddad would watch the TV in the afternoon and, you know, he'd have an afternoon nap and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Whereas I'm kind of almost not far off that age now. And, of course, being involved in triathlon and as, a, as being a coach and seeing lots of athletes who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s plus who are staying active, are maintaining or, or holding on to as much of that strength and that fitness as they can, I don't, you don't, well, I'm obviously older because my perspective's changed, but they just, they don't look, they're not old people anymore. They're not old people in the same way that I used to think old people were old people, if, you, if that makes yeah. sense. So it really, I guess is what we're saying here is it really is, you've got to, you've got to use it or you will lose it. 100%. And we can see such huge variation in, in people's functioning. Let's say, let's take a 70 year old. There can be 70 year olds that are, just as acid, have a better VA2 max than some 20-year-old. Yeah. Incredible strength because they've worked really hard on it. And yes, they may be chronologically 70, but biologically, you put them more in sort of the mid-40s. There is an incredible amount you can do that's within your control to keep that conditioning. And self, you, you are, I would say you are below 50 by a long way. The patients that I see, I'll see many 50-year-olds uh, that are at least 20, 25 years older biologically. Okay. And often that's what you have to do as a good doctor is you kind of you don't look at the number on the screen. You are assessing other parameters to pick up, you know, are they biologically? Where's the frailty? Because you get huge variation. I've, I had, it. in fact, someone here in Lenton, he's 96. He used to be an ex-boxer. He played rugby, he stayed active. Every day he does 15 minutes. Yeah, oh, physical activity yeah. every single day. He showed me the whole routine. He wanted yeah. to show me it. And I couldn't believe he was 96 because I hadn't looked at the screen and I pinned him at about late 60s max. And he goes, uh, just told me it was 96. I had to like scramble to my screen to just double check. He, he wasn't getting cognitively impaired or something. <laughs> and it just showed that it's not about like these huge endeavors. It's a little and often. Oh. You keep doing it. Be consistent. Keep applying yourself, yeah. keep working on it, prevent those long gaps of sedentary activity, then you will be able to maintain functioning. And relax is because at the end of the day, you want to enjoy retirement. You don't yeah. want to be struggling with hospital appointments, symptoms, and burden. And too often I see that. Too often, I would say, for most Western lifestyles, around 60, 65, things start catching up. That's why you, I don't know if you often hear, let's say, friends or family members, as soon as they retire, suddenly yeah. things become obvious. Yeah. They have more time to concentrate on certain symptoms. They become even more inactive because work was the only thing that was getting any kind of movement in their day. Uh, leads to those kind of outcomes. And it's such a shame because, you know, we, we have more money. We have more quality of life in that sense. But we're now lagging behind, you know, places like Okinawa in Japan and Sardinia and Korea and Greece, where they live in comparative poverty, but they have the function of the health problems that that we have. Shouldn't be right, you know. We 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 don't want to enjoy those twilight years with so, so much burden of disease. So we we're in the process actually of putting together some new training programs. Um, cause at, at do through really, we're really passionate about getting, um, people into the sport regardless of their age. Um, so we are putting some training programs together, um, carriage to triathlon training yeah. programs, um, starting with sprints. So starting short, and we've had lots and lots of interest in those. Um, and lots of the kind of people that have been expressing an interest are forties, fifties, sixties, you know, so 
it's not as though we could, as we as we may do with some younger athletes, throw them straight onto a, a training program where they're swimming, cycling, and running six days a week. We've got to effectively build them in gently, where phase one is um, simply being used to doing some exercise with some form of regularity again. That's phase one. I mean, what would you what would you say? Say you've got somebody who's, I don't know, put a number on it, fifty eight. And they want to do a sprint triathlon in six months' time. I'm not, I'm not asking you about training programs as such, mm-hmm. but how would you how would you kind of start that person on that journey? The first kind of I don't know six or eight weeks. Yeah. So, so the most important thing that I'd want to know is kind of where are they mentally in terms of their sort of preparedness to pick up these new habits? Because with triathlon, there's going to be a number of new habits you're going to need to embed, whether that be doing regular training or trying to, you know, pick up new disciplines. And that would be my first step. You know, do they have sort of the the right plan in terms of how they're going to integrate it into their lifestyle? Mm. And once they've sort of got that appreciation, they've looked at the kind of behavior around how they want to implement it, strength and balance is probably the most important elements for the older athlete. The bit that gets neglected and it's the reason why you will, for example, in the pool, may not have the coordination to develop the stroke that we know is going to be the most efficient. You may be putting so much effort in, but if you're not moving forwards, we know that's the end goal. Also, when it comes to preventing injury, there's been lots of studies and people talk about stretching and flexibility and all this kind of, and they are helpful, but by far and away, strength helps to prevent injuries. And I just want to make sure that the vehicle, aka the body, has got everything in place from a SAFI perspective, that it's strong. And it's probably the bit that is most neglected day to day, because let's say if people are sort of having generally active-ish lives, then they'll have some kind of baseline aerobic fitness, but too little straight of training happens in the general population that aren't training individuals. And that can lead to stress fractures. It can lead to more likely getting tendinopathies and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So I would want them maybe even before they spend too much time on the bike or running any kind of significant distances, I want them to really work and hone in their strength. Um, because it would be not only great for their triathlon training, but we know out of all the different elements of physical activity, it's maintaining strength that reduces your risk of developing conditions, whether that be um, metabolic conditions or just mechanical, for example, falling and getting a fracture, very common issue in the older population so i'd say my main main things would be have they got a habit forming behavior set up are they motivated behind that and great training because too often i'll have patients actually that come and see me and they say oh yeah i just got running and then i've got this injury very quickly but then they may be carrying extra weight they may be under muscled all that combination just leads to an inevitable injury and then they become demotivated and frustrated maybe drop out so it's about kind of getting the preparation yeah yeah it's going to be it's going to be an interesting process actually because yeah i'm expecting people to think it's a lot easier than it than it's going to be i think sometimes i mean i know myself going back going back out training again after having not done it for a while like you, like you said yeah. before you you lose it quite quickly yeah and being older and slightly heavier not as flexible it is hard to 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 get get going again effectively yeah. isn't it you so the subtle and mind memory of of what has been, which is probably more difficult. Yeah, I still want to go out. Yeah, you have a third yardstick, yeah. which isn't like beginners. At least when for beginners, they have nothing to compare. But yeah. there's that frustration. I get a lot from, in particular, injured, you know, long-term injured athletes. Mm-hmm. They less motivated to get back on the horse because they so far down the way that it, it's painful to think about the amount of effort that it takes to get from that point back to the original, if that's even possible. Mm-hmm. And all I can say is that you have to constantly reframe where you are in life. You know, try not to look back too often. Try not to think what what has been or what could have been. And just think, hey, look, where I am right now, let me just try and focus on preparing tomorrow and the day after to be those steps forward. You know, don't look at the clock with your previous Strava posts or that kind of stuff. <laughs> just focus on the here and now and, and work on that. I, I'm always thinking to myself, is it too late for me to get myself fitter than I've ever been before in my life? 
I never want to admit to myself that I've got past the point of, you know, because I used to, I wasn't an amazing athlete, but I was okay. You know, I was just over three hours for a marathon. I'd do kind of was nine plus by that. <laughs> well, I, you know, but that's, you know, 19 minute 5K, just over 10 for an Ironman, that kind of thing. And this wasn't that long ago. This was like 10 years ago or something. So I was 40 then. Yeah. Um, I need but, to learn from you because if you just went over 10 from an Ironman with those, that's incredible. The thing is, like, I, for example, the 16 minute bike play, yeah. but I've, uh, my fastest full Ironman is 10.55. Right. Probably a lot of the. Okay. Well, have have a, we'll have a separate conversation about it. Uh, yeah, this was Barcelona, and uh, I kind of did start to pick out faster courses. So you. Where were you? Finally, the outlaw. Uh, okay. So All right. Pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe. I don't a, <laughs> Maybe have a separate call. So I, I, so I think about: Will I ever get back to? Will I ever be able to get back to that kind of condition again? And I haven't quite given up yet. I might be, it might be a pipe dream, but I haven't quite given up yet. But I've got to start somewhere. I'm just kind of start restarting at the moment. Like physiologically, you can mm. definitely. You can. Yeah. Uh, is it going to be the same amount of work as last time? Nope. It's going to be a lot more. Be a lot more work. And then you have to decide: Is that what yeah. you want in your life? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and getting that balance. But no, you can. Mm -hmm. You can do some incredible things. Mm -hmm. You know, well to within older age. It just takes more and more effort mm -hmm. to achieve it. I don't. Want, I want it to be easier, not harder. I got. <laughs> it's harder. That's the honest. So what about? Um, okay. So obviously we're kind of we are we are going to be talking about other athletes you know we were talking a lot about older athletes at the moment but i guess that's that's predominantly what um we're going to talk about menopause surely but that's predominantly what we're looking at but in terms of um uh other things that older athletes can do and we, let, okay let's let's start by defining what an older athlete is where would you say is the kind of tipping point sounds a little bit extreme but you know what i mean where, what's the point where people start to have to work a little bit harder to get those those gains Really tricky. I'd say if I'm going purely biologically, uh, then as early as 30 is uh -huh. probably when you reach your peak. Now, this varies depending on the type of sport because, like, our muscles are built off different fibers that have different functionings. But generally, for most kind of strength based um, sports, 30 is going to be your peak. It's going to decline from there. They say that you. <laughs> it's slightly depressing, isn't it? it, it like, <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, the loss that you see if you're still stimulating yeah very very minimal yeah we often use the term that you'll lose one percent uh, muscle mass a year from 30 uh -huh. but that's living a western lifestyle because what has to happen when you become 30 you get more responsibilities you have a job you probably maybe started having kids and that sedentary behavior leads to that muscle you know there are many people into the 30s and 40s that build more muscle mass than they ever had in their 20s so like this is all just looking at it physiologically. Endurance tends to do a bit better. So you'll see like in mid thirties to late thirties probably is the peak for endurance stuff like Ironman, marathon runners. That's probably where we see the sort of the optimal uh, results. Just look at Elliot, for example, he's just been getting faster and faster into his uh, late thirties. Um, but then I'd say from 40, no matter what type of sport you're doing, the decline is, is, is beginning. And by decline, that's it's assuming that you do exactly the same as what you've been doing before. Of course, if you start training harder, smarter, and you start fueling yourself better, then no, you can still get gains. But this is assuming that you do exactly the same thing every day of your life, and you just want to look at the effects of aging. That's about when I would start to classify them as an older athlete. Just assuming that the physiological changes are happening. That's kind of why we use that term. It doesn't mean that you've reached your peak. It's all dependent on, have you reached your actual peak? That's the question. So yeah. many people, they may have done not, not much in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. In which case, you've got a lot of room to grow. Yeah. If you were an athlete in your 20s and 30s, no, for sure, you are never going to go faster if you were already at off. Yeah, no, I was I was certainly my fit, uh, fittest at the time when I, I was just talking about, I, I was fitter then than when I was when I was in my 20s and 30s. Even though I used to train and do exercise, I didn't do the kind of things that I was doing to do, you know, long distance triathlon and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, what about um, what about other things? Um, now I've actually got a Whoop band on trial at the moment. Um, I've kind of held off getting one. Um, 
I've used them with when coaching athletes before and found them quite problematic in terms of, well, how do you how do you coach an athlete who you speak to maybe once or twice a week when they're being told by their whoop that they've got to take a day off every second day or, yeah. you know, it's, it, it doesn't work very well. Yeah. And I worry about the psychological element of it telling you that you're knackered when you might actually not be, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I've got it on trial at the moment because I'm keeping a track on my sleep because I get up early, I get to bed late, and it's a motivating tool for me to keep an eye on that, if nothing else. So what other things can older athletes do to try and support their actual physical training? I'm obviously thinking about rest and diet and that kind of thing. Yeah, those are the two things that I would say are fundamental. Like for the old athlete that's maybe getting back into training and creating good quality rest. And when we say good quality rest, that's not just still going back to your crazy sort of schedules of, you know, here, there, everywhere, uh, rushing around, high stress, all that. You know, we want rest where you're giving yourself time to relax both physically and mentally. Because I would say there's some needs to don't do enough of. They're always the kind of, I, I want to do more, I want to be better, kind of mindset, and that's fantastic. But if you are leading really stressful lives, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not fueling yourself with the right stuff, your body just will not be able to make the most of the effort you've put in yeah. on the physical activity. And if that's your goal, if your goal is you really want to, let's say, bring down that time, achieve that distance, etc., then you need to put in the same amount of effort to those things as you do in that particular workout. Because you don't want to go for all that pain and build up all that lactate just to only get 60% of the gain yeah. because you haven't slept properly, because you've ate lots of processed foods, because you've been really, really stressed. Say, particularly for the older athlete, one of the advantages you have is generally, touch wood, you have a bit more disposable income. You have a bit more time in your hands. And sometimes we have to learn and give ourselves permission to do a little less be a really big tip look at in your lifestyle how can you just do a bit less do you need to say yes to everything do you need to take up every single opportunity that comes your way can you balance work to maybe earn a bit less and spend a bit less you know these things it's financial help is something that's a bit taboo and often like we talk about it it's important to balance those things out because you need to decide what are the priorities in your life you know when you're 70, 80, are you going to think about that deadline at work that, you know, you, you managed to achieve because you put in an extra three hours? You're not. So it's not about being a bad employee or, or not striving at work. It's about getting that balance. Yeah. And if you can find that balance, you're then more likely to incorporate into your life things that you do want. You have to have more time to prepare meals more time to spend relaxing, maybe spending time with your partner, with your kids, just enjoying life. And those things, they really do matter. They really do impact. And if you speak to and observe athletes, they spend a lot of time actually doing that. Those high performers actually know the importance of proper rest rather than trying to overload ourselves with sort of this much because we always want to be. Well, I think that's, that's really interesting actually because obviously we deal with age group athletes, so amateur athletes, and almost the professionals sometimes have, it's easier for them because they're training and resting and they're looking after themselves. Their job is themselves, isn't it? Whereas age groupers, I think they've got it really tough. And then I have quite a few conversations with people about different types of age group athletes. So you'll get age group athletes who are effectively retired or they have lots of money and they can train like a professional competing against another age group athlete who is working a 50 or 60 hour week and has got kids and that you can't compare the two. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough to, to balance it all. I think what's so important is that you just compete against yourself. You know, unless this is your job, I genuinely believe it's so important. Yes. Don't get me wrong. Have the fun of trying to reach certain targets, reach goals, etc. But at the end of the day, you're so right. There'll be, people on that start line the same maybe challenges that you have and you just don't know um of where they sit in terms of how much you know training they've been able to fit it so really important just to focus on yourself and just maximize what you can do 
you know, there's always something that we can do no matter what challenges we have in place. And sometimes when we're in over our head and we're getting stressed, it leads to inaction because you just feel so overwhelmed. I just you could take a moment, keep making your next step smaller and smaller if you're finding it difficult. It may be that your next step is going to be just one thing. You're going to decide to, for example, drop that bit of processed food. Maybe you have a, a Mars bar or a chocolate bar in your day. Just swap that for something else. Swap that for an apple or a pear. Okay. And you may think that, well, that's not going to do much. That's unlikely to change the stopwatch at the end of the, uh, the event. But just accomplish that particular step. Accomplish that goal and then move on to something else. Okay. It may be that I can chew up, enjoy a bit of alcohol, but maybe I'm just going to have one less drink per week. Maybe I'm just going to do that and then keep doing that. And if you keep making small step after small step after small step, you then get the staircase where after a while, you look 12 months down the line, you've made lots of these little steps and you've made these little marginal gains. And that, these marginal gains added on top of each other, they can have a profound impact in yeah. about the triathlon score. Your health will be better for it. So, you know, try and try and just control what you can do and, you feel overwhelmed, just start really small. They they matter as well. Mm, yeah. Athletes struggle with that though, don't they? Athletes athletes struggle to, you know, some some athletes will look inward, they'll just be challenging themselves, like you say, but the vast majority of athletes that I've seen, and when I say when I talk about athletes, I'm talking about anyone who does any kind of regular exercise. Um, they they it's the Strava effect, isn't it? It's it's they want to some people are kind of friendly with it in terms of trying to compete against their friends, but some people are absolutely obsessed by looking at other people's performances and comparing themselves. You know, I know, I know kind of 60 year old athletes comparing themselves to 30 year old athletes and they're complaining that they can't perform in the same kind of way because it's on Strava. I should be able to do that. But it's a difficult thing to say, isn't it? It's a difficult thing to you to say, well, they're 30 years younger than you because it's difficult to accept, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, Kind of, you know, it's 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 tricky because sometimes that kind of comparison can be healthy because, as you say, it's done in a friendly way and it's a way to motivate and push you to get out to see your friends gone on a ride. You think, oh, okay, maybe I should go on a ride and Saturday. Yeah. In that case, brilliant. But I think what's so important is that we are so different. You know, we are so different. It's not just our social surroundings that may be different and our social circumstances that are different. But also physiologically, we are different. Um, and that's why comparing yourself often isn't that effective a tool. You know, it isn't that effective a tool because, for example, if your friends all got slower because maybe life got busy, etc., are you now going to suddenly get slower because, you know, it's okay? They've done it. So it's the same way that, like, you just need to focus on you. And, you know, you mentioned that you use the term athletes where well, you need just age groupers and, that's totally right. You know, I actually use the term athletes for people that aren't even active yet. Because um, when you say that you are an athlete, and if you truly believe it, that you're an athlete, you're already in the right mindset. Because the mindset and the identity of an athlete is someone that looks after themselves physically, that pushes the boundaries, that, you know, tests themselves, loves challenges. And that's so important that we have that kind of identity, generally. Just, I'll be speaking to patients that have been active for 20 years that are significantly overweight. They have four or five long-term health conditions. And I often put up in these group consultations a big slide saying, you are an athlete, okay? You are an athlete from today. And I think that's the epitome of not comparing yourself to someone else because they, the fastest 100 meters is probably slower than what we can do in the last 5K of an Ironman. Do you know what I mean? That's how big the gulf is in physiology. Yeah. But they still need to think of themselves as an athlete so that they keep growing. Mm. Okay. It's all about that growth. If you find that you're comparing yourself with others and it's actually inhibiting you, my top tip is actually something that a number of the people that I've worked with is Strava for your um, uh, runs. You know, just find somewhere where you can, maybe there's a Garmin and therefore it's just there and you can just have all your data there and you're comparing it. If you are finding you're getting into that cycle, you have to kind of stop. You know, you have to break that kind of contact with it. It is unhealthy. It is unhealthy. I've seen I've seen a few athletes who are absolutely obsessed by it, and they will they will not just look at other athletes' workouts. They will go into the in terms of they've done a run. They will go into it and have a look at heart rate, 
power and completely dissect what the other person's other person. It's crazy, isn't it? But I've kind of been there. I, I kind of feel like I've grown up a little bit myself, and I kind of don't worry about that kind of stuff so much. But I've been there. I know how they. I know how they feel. So it's it's it is a difficult one. Um, it is, it is, but like, I in fact had a colleague that stopped running because they would see my Strava post because I, I actually before I think I was twenty six, twenty seven, really sedentary. I was the worst. I was actually significantly overweight. Uh, I had something called fatty liver disease. Um, and I took up exercise, I started the whole process, and he was always the active one at where I worked. Um, and suddenly, you know, I, I I matched him, I then passed him, I was then a million miles away from him, and he actually stopped, he stopped coming to park run, he stopped okay. running, a uh, little away, and he just made, and he specifically said, he said, I stopped running because I no longer enjoyed it anymore, because he had lost that identity of being the active one. Yeah. And that just, you know, it shows you, how destructive yeah. comparing yourself with people is because he was incredible. Like everyone's incredible in their own right. He has far more responsibilities than I have. So he shouldn't be comparing himself yeah. to me. He is 12 years older than me. You know, he shouldn't be comparing himself to me. Yeah. So important. Just create your world. And sometimes we have to be a bit more selfish and it's not a negative term. Just focus on yourself. You know, focus on what you can do. Um, to optimize where you are. So you, you talked about your running and your park runs, particularly there. Um, before you came today, I did a little bit of little bit of research on you, um, and I came across your okay, you call it your links page, where it's got all your all the things that you do, and it's the longest links page I've ever seen. <laughs> ever seen. You, 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 I'm seeing you do a lot of stuff, don't you? So I want to talk about a few of the bits and bobs that are on there. So you are um, involved with Swim England, is that right? Yep. What's your, what do you do with that? With Swim England. Um, and I work with a number of other clinicians. We're, we're a bit of a team. And it's all around how do we support patients into the water. And in fact, we do it in a number of ways. We have a, um, a program called the Water Wellbeing Program. And this is where staff at leisure centers are trained specifically to support patients that may be struggling with pain, with poor mobility, with various health conditions like multiple sclerosis, uh, maybe a stroke, getting them into the water. Do you know that, for example, if you don't feel confident in your body, you'd be much less confident to enter the water. You know, absolutely. That's, 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 that's very straightforward. And so we, we work to try and train pools up so that they get that understanding and ability, and it's fantastic. We also have a, um, if, if you search pool finder, if you just go on the Swim England website, there's a pool finder tab where you can search for which leisure center has those additional trainings. If, let's say you're listening to this and you have those additional needs to do that. But I also hands-on like to support patients into the water. And in fact, at Newbold Common uh, Leisure Center in Leamington Spa, I have a patient swimming group. It's completely free for patients to attend and it's targeted specifically at those with long-term health conditions. So I can show them the water, they can be there, they can feel more confident, they, they can and just experience what just moving in water can do because for many, it's a gate, it's a great gateway movement. Yeah. You know, it's not load-bearing. It's it also, it's easier to do as a group because I also do walking groups and running groups. It's always solid at the back. It's always a difficult thing for people to manage. And the number one reason why many people don't come, they say, look, I'd love to come, but I know you're going to be waiting around for me. And I know that you guys will all be lovely and nice about it, but you're still going to be waiting around for me. Yeah. But in the pool where there's lanes, yeah. everyone's keeping tabs of how many laps you've done. You know, I barely can remember how many laps I've done. And normally the garment has to tell me, and it's normally wrong. Um, but it's just a great way to access water. And really enjoy my role at Swim England because it just gives, it gives many people that otherwise would find any activity a way to get moving. I think there's definitely um, a gap between almost um, people who, or kids and youngsters who you train regularly at school and university and that kind of thing. And then you get people who are naturally motivated and fit and have, have found their way back into sport, um, you know, slightly older. And then there's a, there's a group in the middle who 
I've been, haven't done any training, I haven't done any exercise for a long time, but just don't know how to make that first step back into fitness. They don't want to be seen in their swimming gear. They don't want to be seen in tight, tight clothes. They're, they're worried about making a fool of themselves. And as a result, they don't do anything at all. Uh, and certainly identify, I've identified that in terms of the triathlon side of things and that there's lots of people who want to get into the sport but are terrified. They don't know what kit they need. They don't, they're worried about asking stupid questions. Therefore, they never do it. And, and again, that's what we're trying to do with the carriage to triathlon side of things because there, there is a hole there in the middle which has got people stuck in it and they, they do want to get out but they don't know how to do it. And I guess that's the same across all sorts of different sports, isn't it? You use the term like in behavior change, friction. So what you've done with your couch to triathlon is you're trying to reduce the friction yeah. that's involved because you're making it easier, you're laying it out, you're making it clear what steps they need to do, mm. you, you're making these steps smaller, more manageable. And it's so important that we try to reduce friction to the things that we want to do. That's why, you know, when we mentioned what was my first tip for those older athletes that are getting active, it was about getting that kind of mindset right. That's about making it as frictionless as possible. You know, mm. the other ideas is, for example, if you want to go cycling the next day, that was your plan. Today, you know, already pump up your tires, make sure the bike's ready, pack your bag, get your, you know, whatever you're going to have for nutrition on the ride, um, your puncture repair kit, get it all done. That when you wake up the next day, all you have to do, the only step you're going to need to motivate yourself to do is to get on the bike. Because trust me, it sounds silly, but having to do all those things on that day can be the difference between not going on that ride at all. Because suddenly someone says, oh, they want this from you, and you get this text, et cetera. And then you go, oh, I haven't sorted out my bike. I haven't got my clothes ready. Where's this? Where's that? That's enough to yeah. stop it. So it's about trying to reduce friction to the habits you want to fall, and vice versa, increase friction to the things you want to try and stop. So for example, if let's see, a lot of time watching TV or spend a lot of time on your phone playing put time locks on your apps. Delete certain apps. Try to make it harder to do those things um, than, than it is to do the things you want. So absolutely, I think that that whole catch to triathlon is just a brilliant way of making yeah, that a little bit easier to mm. start what at the beginning and for the first few bumps will be difficult. Mm. So you just got to make it as easy as you can. Yeah, we're looking forward to launching, actually. It should be uh, hopefully in the next couple of months or so. So going back to your list of all these things that you do, you're a TV doctor. Yes. <laughs> What's it like being a TV? So you, you're on um, Pack Lunch, Steph's Pack Lunch, is that right? On yeah, Channel 4? It's, uh, it's on um, every weekday, uh, and it's essentially a daytime show where they've got a little bit of lifestyle, a little bit of, you know, there's some food uh, there's from the chefs and, and they go through common topics. And it's, 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 it was designed initially for, you know, when it went into lockdown, a lot of people start working from home and they felt, you know, quite isolated. You haven't got your last time banter anymore. That, that's what it's there. Okay. Yeah. There for that bit of banter. And it's a great show with a really fantastic team. Um, and I started September 21. And it's just been such an incredible experience. When I first went on, it was just supposed to be a one-off as far as I was aware. Um, and then they sort of invited me back and we did a few more. And then now it's a weekly thing. So if you do want to put yourself and subject yourself through uh, some some segments with myself, it's every Tuesday at lunchtime. How did you find How did you find doing doing that? Is it live or is it live? Okay. It's live. So they ring for error. Um, <laughs> And we've done some hilarious stuff. I think that's what I've enjoyed the most out of it, is that you're doing stuff and you're talking about things that you're unlikely to have ever done outside of, of the TV studio because they love to sort of discuss some weird and wonderful things. Often we will, like, pick trends that are running on TikTok and basically say, is this a load of rubbish or is this some medical backing? Generally, it's a load of rubbish, unfortunately. I wish we did find something miraculous on TikTok. Um, but yeah, we like to have fun with it. But on, so on a serious note, I put in a lot of my kind of passion for physical activity there. So we've done physical activity segments. We, we once got the entire sort of studio basically to walk 800 meters around the dock, you know, just because to tell people that 
sitting in these for too long and for too much of your day is such a massive impact on your health. And, and average eight to 10 hours is what the, the amount of time a UK adult spends sat down. Eight to 10 hours, you know, like that's, that's a huge amount of the time we're actually awake. So that's crazy. You gotta find ways to just incorporate movement back in. It doesn't have to be a uh, an interval session, you know, it doesn't have to be on your turbo trainer. Get it into your day, incorporate little bits. That will make a big difference, breaking up the sedentary activity. And how did you how did you find getting involved in that? How did how did they how did they how did you get involved in the in the first one, for example? Really random. Um, so I well, I was working one day and I got a call from my secretary. I was duty doctor in time, which duty doctor means basically you have to see all the patients once all the other GPs are full. So it's not a good day. You're very busy. Um, I got a phone call from, from the secretary and she was like, oh, by the way, Cesspack Lunch is on the phone. And I'd never even heard of Cesspack Lunch. They recently launched. <laughs> and I was like, firstly, how is a pack lunch on the phone? Like that was that I didn't get. <laughs> Um, and I was like, do you know what? I was like, is she a patient? And they're like, she's like, no, no. I was like, then, then I'm, it doesn't matter. Leave it. Yeah. I had no idea who it was. But anyway, I get an email saying that I'll be trying to contact you with Steph Pet Lunch from Channel 4 Studios. You'd like to come on. And I'm so, oh my, why? I just told Julie to, to hang up on them. Um, and so, yeah, I got back in touch with them. And they wanted me to cover, at the time, COVID was obviously very prominent. And to, to discuss what's the difference in COVID, a cold, and flu, that. Make it. Uh, I thought it was just going to be a one-off, so I did it. Uh, they, in fact, contacted me in the first place because the researcher just put into Google, and this is incredible, um, she's put best GP in UK, and for some reason... I mean, you're right. Because I was nominated the GP of the year the year before. Okay. And so there was a website where I was on, and my surname starts with A, it's Alan Zabady, and so there were six people that were nominated. And, um, and obviously I was at the top. So they contacted me. In fact, I didn't win out of the six, but because of my surname gives with A, I'll, I'll always remember. <laughs> like, there's always a benefit of something beginning with A. Yeah. So yeah, I got invited, and, and I just did the first one, and, and then they invited me back for another one. And after that, they were like, "Do you know what? Do you want to come on regularly?" Well, you've got you've got the perfect. Don't anyway. I'm gonna I'm gonna flatter you here. You got the perfect voice for it. <laughs> you know, you've got you've got. The way you express yourself is, is, is perfect for that kind of thing. I yeah, 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 yeah. I definitely, I've always enjoyed presenting and teaching. I've done a lot of that, like, in sort of the medical field. Yeah. This is the first time that I was doing any kind of presenting to the lay public. And I really enjoyed it. I actually found it more liberating. Like, there's yes, less kind of need for, I would say, rigor. Of course, you've, you've got to be, be clear. You've got to be accurate. There's got to be rigor. But... When you're doing a medical talk, it always just to be in a certain format, in a certain way. It's very rigid. Mm -hmm. and I've done segments with Russell Kane, a comedian, where, you know, he's just been, you know, cranning about, you know, dancing here or there. Uh, and I'm trying to teach people the importance of flexibility. And, and you know, I've had um, segments where we've simulated one of the chefs to go through labor through like a tennis machine so they can see what the pain is like and how he can manage with different pain relief. You know, you just wouldn't do that. You just wouldn't do that if it's not on daytime TV. So uh, I've always been trying to get triathlon it on, in fact, out okay. of the program. So if, we, <laughs> if I ever manage to get that idea across the line, I'll be calling you to, uh, <laughs> um, to so we can do a segment show you so your athletes on. But for sure, like, it's just, it's a way that I feel like I can um, get some really important topics of lifestyle. It's such a big audience. Yeah, uh, yeah been really helpful in my own career to get other opportunities through that i don't know if it was um steph's pack lunch or if it was another tv show that you did or quite where i saw it but i saw you talking about the menopause uh and in particular the male menopause which i thought was interesting i always thought um male menopause was a bit of a joke that women made about <laughs> about about men <laughs> but it's an actual thing so I don't, I, I really don't know anything about the male menopause. So why don't you kind of give me the lowdown on what? Yes, yes. Like male menopause, sometimes terms the uh, andropause because uh, the hormone that predominantly plays a role out of the reproductive hormones in men is testosterone. Bear in mind that testosterone is in both men and women. 
and over the years, your testosterone levels will drop. Unlike with women where it tends to be a more sudden decline, somewhere on average between the age of 48 to 52. However, some women can suffer from this much earlier and can go later. But in men, it's, it's a more slow and progressive decline. The rate of decline varies from men to men. And also, there's a number of factors that influence those testosterone levels. For example, strength training, endurance training, they all help to boost testosterone up. Okay. Um, having uh, increased weight lowers testosterone. Alcohol drops testosterone. Um, having uh, high stress, another thing to drop testosterone. Your body doesn't feel like it needs to be reproductive. If it's stressed, that's not a safe time to bring in offspring. So that's how kind of the mind works. And what we've seen over the years, unfortunately, due to this increase in, in poor lifestyle, we've seen the rate at which testosterone declines is increasing faster and faster. So men are starting to exhibit symptoms. And symptoms can be really quite serious. From a mild perspective, you're going to notice that your lack of energy, sleep quality is going to decline. As we reach sort of more moderate drops in testosterone, that's where some of the sexual symptoms can occur. Um, poor erections, uh, issues with uh, sort of mental health, you can have sort of low mood, anxiety that creeps in. We go to severe ends when we've really got low testosterone. Acts on your muscle mass, on your bone health and the bone density. And it can very much accelerate aging massively. So we need to improve that awareness amongst men around testosterone for, for two key reasons. One is because there's a lot you can do in your own lifestyle to boost up those levels. And we know that the various benefits that physical activity brings you, but this is a very tangible way that it brings those benefits, boosting their testosterone and improving your health. But also those severe cases, testosterone replacement is really important because of course you need to do those lifestyle measures, but that's going to take time to have an effect. We do not want to see the long-term impacts of reduced bone density, reduced muscle mass, and, and, and all those elements. So testosterone replacement can be an effective tool. We use the alongside lifestyle to improve that. So you know, if men are listening and they feel like struggling energy, they've been struggling with the mood, oh, you get that brain fog, something that women will describe a lot of during the menopause, um, that kind of inability to concentrate as well as they could Getting those kind of symptoms, look, it may not be low testosterone, but that's something to explore. So do speak to your healthcare professional. Do ask them as to whether this is a possibility. And this is a simple blood test that we can okay. do to just check your testosterone level and get an idea as to where it's at. So um, apologies if you mentioned this earlier, but what, what kind of age are we looking at for that, that kind of decline? It varies. Like I'd say the youngest I've ever seen it is kind of mid-40s, that kind of thing. Most, it's around the 60s. Okay. At about the age of 40, our testosterone begins to decline. All right. It begins to decline no matter what, you know, what you're doing, unless you've suddenly had a transformation in your lifestyle where you've gone from terrible lifestyle to good. Right. Assuming that you're just doing the same things day in, day out, you're going to see a slow decline. And that is, is, is natural, and that's fine. And for most, if they are leading a healthy lifestyle, you will die long before the testosterone level is at a level where you need to worry about. But unfortunately, we're seeing that that curve much steeper now because one is active. They're not eating the right things. They are over consuming certain things, and so we just need to be careful and and pick up those symptoms in order to support you with potential replacement if that's required. Okay, that's that's really interesting because I, I seriously I kind of said it partially in jest, but mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain element of that is oh, you go through the you go through the male menopause, and it's it's a bit of a bit of a joke. But if it's an actual thing which can potentially affect athletes as they're getting older, then it's obviously something which they need to be they need to be aware of and part of the the bigger pie of things that they may need to start keeping an eye on. So simple blood tests. So would you get that done through the NHS yeah, through your GP? Getting it done at the, through the NHS through your GP. Um, they will take up you know detailed history from you because. Low testosterone is just one off the potential differentials. We need to look for other things, for example, thyroid impairment, look for uh, uh, electrolyte imbalances. There's a number of things that could be causing it. But then they'll do that blood test with that panel 
and they can get an idea. If the testosterone is low, then it's about you know how low it is. If it's only marginally low, they may advise you to do certain lifestyle uh, changes and then retest it. Below a certain threshold, they're going to want to encourage you to go on testosterone replacement while you do those lifestyle changes in order to sort of mitigate the okay. impact. Yeah. On the yeah, really, really interesting. Okay, and in terms of females going through the menopause, so um, we have quite a few athletes who just happen to be of a certain age who are who are going through the menopause at the moment um, in and around the squad. Um, and as a coach, I'm aware that you're better off training in some kind of ways in certain periods of the cycle and not the periods. Um, what do you explain to me in your kind of in your terms? What kind of happens um, as an athlete? as you go through the menopause and what can be done to kind of counteract that? Okay. The menopause signifies when the natural cycle that happens in women, called the menstrual cycle, this is a monthly, although women are shorter, some women longer, but approximately 28 days average, you have a sort of cyclical pattern of the key reproductive hormones. And there are three key hormones that we need to think about in women. We have testosterone, which we've already talked about. We have oestrogen and progesterone. And we need to think of oestrogen as your power hormone. You know, oestrogen helps develop muscle tissue. It helps strengthen bones. It helps uh, improve cardiovascular health. And it's actually the reason why before the menopause, incidence of cardiovascular disease is much lower in women. Then men. Once they go through the menopause, they lose that protection because one of the key changes is that your oestrogen level drops massively. It's a massive nosedive decline. And when we look at women pre-menopause, they have got this regular cycle where the oestrogen level is going up and down. And some will notice that when, for example, they've had their bleed and they're in the first 14 days afterwards, we call this the follicular phase, and the oestrogen level is building, they may notice and perceive more performance. Now, this is a difficult one, and we need more research in this because actually in the field of sports medicine, only 2% of funding is spent on female athletic um, performance assessment, which is ridiculous. But from the studies that we do have, that there isn't strong evidence that there is a change in outcome of performance. However, when they've looked at perceived performance and perceived effort, there is quite a lot of evidence to show that women feel like it's a lot more effort when the oestrogen levels are lower, which is in the latter half of the cycle. So this is, you know, when you're about to go on to your next bleed. Mm. So what I tend to say is so important here don't automatically assume that because I'm in this phase of the cycle, my oestrogen levels are high, I should be take, making the most of that, and then when they're low, I should be 100% resting. No, I think we should have awareness that, yes, in the first half of your cycle, you've got those higher levels, second half, maybe not, and just react to how your body is. It's a bit like with that whoop that we talked about before, that sometimes I get frustrating when patients come to me with the whoop scores, and they go, oh, I'm the feeling incredible otherwise but the whoops telling me i'm not yeah you know because your perception is the most effective method of assessing where you are it is it doesn't lie you know it doesn't pretend and so the studies have demonstrated that you know when they perform at their best even when they have got low perceived um, potential so yeah like just have that balance when you when you say pre-menopause and just Listen to your body. If you are going through that cycle, you have very tricky periods that do, let's say, cause you to have less energy, more aches, discomfort, then yeah, just turn it down, allow your body to rest and recover, build back up once you're feeling better. If you do really struggle with your periods, however, I would recommend seeing your GP about it. A lot of women just put up with symptoms that they don't have to. And it's always surprising to me when I when I ask patients how long have they been struggling with this. They go, oh, well, 12, 15 years. Now, this, I thought this was just normal. So 100%, go speak to your, your healthcare professional. Just find out that they may well say that, look, you know, this is what we can do. But there is an awful lot we can do to help with the hormones to improve those kind of feelings. Now, menopause itself, we've seen a big decline in estrogen. And that has an impact in a number of areas. One, your bone density 
it increases. Oestrogen really helps to promote good, strong bones. And the other is the type of muscle fiber that you use for strength, okay? Because we have what's called fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. The strength component does decline because that is very much governance and supported and stimulated by oestrogen. So you may notice that you, you are less strong, that your recovery time after a straight session is longer, that the you know DOMs that you experience are more severe, and that is frustrating. And and for a lot of women, they, they'll they'll come and, and they'll explain just how furiating it is to be putting in the same amount of effort at work and just not getting the same results, having to drop down weights. We know what it's like when we go to the gym. We always want to see progression, don't we? Or at least holding at the, at the same weight. It can be very frustrating when you drop. And so we have to balance that up and we have to think about how can we combat that? You know, what tips can we do? And I'd say the last point before we look at the potential sort of options for treatment is probably the biggest decline that occurs through the menopause and afterwards is the burden of the symptoms. So the brain fog, the low mood, the anxiety, the aches and pains. Although, yes, you see a decline in muscle mass, you get more drop in performance just because the motivation to do physical activity when you're feeling that rough, yeah. it's just not there. You know, you've got, we talked about friction before, you've now increased the friction massively by having all those different symptoms to, to get through before you can even think about trying to improve it. So, when it comes to trying to tackle this and trying to, to minimize the impact that the menopause has, super recommend basically taking this as a moment to reassess your lifestyle as a whole. Back to the marginal gains. I know that you may be working hard already at lots of different areas. Maybe you walk readily, maybe you do triathlon, etc. But no matter who you are, there's always more you can do. And that's the frustration in life a little bit. You've got to have to do more than you've done before to be at the same level as you were before. That's the facts of the matter. You can't, uh, you know, go through and have less oestrogen, lower testosterone, and still have the same performance. You can have to put in more work. And the second thing is think about hormone replacement. Hormone replacement is when used correctly for the right period of time and monitored and managed by your healthcare professional is safe. You know, we use it widespread. There were scares in the past. There was this study called the Million Women Study, which picked up increased risk of cancers like breast cancer. And that is the case, um, but it's very small. It's very small numbers that we see an increase. And when, for example, we often compare it to, um, to like how much extra alcohol you drink, and it's something like half a glass of wine a week. That's the comparative increased risk. Yeah, people are drinking half a glass of wine with no concerns. So, like, hormone replacement can be really effective if performance is what you really care about and want to try to maintain a certain, you know, level of conditioning. I'd say it'll be really difficult without hormone replacement therapy, if I'm being honest. But then again, it varies. Because some women will go through the menopause with very minimal symptoms, others with really severe symptoms. So it's about making that kind of balance call but I'd say there's no harm in having that discussion you know looking at the risks and the numbers and deciding you know what is it that you want to try to maximize is it that you want to maintain strength and endurance and those elements which I say is probably going to be the biggest indicator for your long-term health in 20 30 years time once you're 80 or, or do you want to kind of minimize those risks and instead just focus on what you can do within your lifestyle it's, there's, there's no right or wrong answer but, but I think it's that appreciation that 100% going through the menopause is going to have an impact on your performance one way or another. And it's frustrating. And it's not just you. You know, this is something that's unfortunately kind of ingrained to female physiology. So if you're an, if you're an athlete and you train regularly or you're a coach and you have uh, female athletes, are you, are you suggesting that the, they don't um, carte blanche make adjustments based on their cycle, they they adjust on the kind of almost like on a dynamic basis depending on how they're actually feeling it at any given time. Because you'd feel different on one cycle as you would to the next, presumably. You're not necessarily going to feel the same every single month. Precisely. And there's just not enough evidence to show that it has 
an impact on performance. You know, maybe in the future when there's more funding that goes into female um, athletic performance, then maybe we can give more bespoke data. It's very clear, and I actually spoke to um, uh, Dr. Zanini, who works in Loughborough University. So he's very much an endurance sports um, field. He does a lot of trials. And he said that at the moment, we just do not have enough information to support tailoring it to the cycle. Yep. You should tailor it to the athlete. The same way yeah. you would do it to a man as well. He said, you just have to tailor it. Maybe in time, we will get more bespoke. But so far, the limited data that we have just points to not being much actual difference on the stopwatch, but you can definitely perceive a difference in the effort. So it's a kind of better, isn't yeah. it? Uh, and it's not a bad thing in general. Like if, if have a period of time in the month where they feel less able to push themselves, I would say that's great because we should go through these natural cycles. You shouldn't just be on, 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 building load constantly, constantly. That's never going to work. You're eventually going to get completely worn out. So I sometimes tell people that, look, you've got to use that to your advantage. You know, if that's a time when you're not feeling like you can push yourself to, to your peak, that's perfect rest time. We can build that in. Doesn't mean you're doing nothing, not at all, but you're going to do maybe zone two stuff. You're maybe going to work on some flexibility stuff um, and try and work with what you've got. So just like if there's a period of the month where you feel more up for it, really, you know when your interval sessions and your hard workouts are going to go. So yeah, it's about, about working around that. I think yeah. that's so important just generally because a lot of people, they'll lead busy lives. They'll be doing so much of work. They're so fixated on doing a training plan and they won't build it around what's going on in their life. And they wonder, oh, why can't I hit my interval segments where after my 11-hour shift where I've barely eaten anything, drunk anything, and I've been sat down for 12 hours? Yeah. And it's just not going to work. Yeah. You have to adapt. You, if, for the age groupers, you will actually get less for your effort if you just sort of steamroll through things and think, okay, I have to take every you know, training session. Move it around. Adapt it. Sometimes maybe that interval session should have just been, you know, zoned to, you know, 8K job. You know, you've got to work around it. It's it's so difficult. Athletes, I see athletes all the time. If they've got a training session, it's got to be done. It's got to be done. It's got to be green. Uh, you know, in training peaks, it's got to be green. It's got to be ticked off. And I've seen them time and time again where if they can't do it on that day, they'll push it forward another day. And then they can't do that one and they'll push it forward. And they end up with, you know, six sessions in two days or <laughs> some you know that, that's what happens is they shuff, shift they don't like to miss anything um but i certainly try and educate my athletes in terms of i mean we have a general rule that if you miss a session it's gone yeah you move on to the next one and do your best effort on the next session you always let the session go and and take the advantage of the additional unexpected rest yeah yeah uh, what you're going to do is if you try to load it all up is you're going to put all the effort and that's great from a kind of mental endurance perspective but your body's just not going to have time it's going yeah. to get overloaded you're not going to actually see the benefit yeah. going backwards yeah you can 100 go backwards with, the, with with overtraining and then it has a knock-on effect on your sleep and you start to have poor sleep and then suddenly that then leads to next week being impaired as well so i know what it's like trust me i have it as well you know i, I have a number of roles balancing it all up and doing i can assure you every week that i plan out for my training Pretty much without fail, one of those sessions will not go the way it's supposed to. It has to get either cancelled or shortened or adapted. And it's not thinking like that's a failure. It's just understanding that, look, I the work, I enjoy the work I do, and I'm not a full-time triathlete. I still want to do my best, which is going to be by getting to the end of that week totally exhausted. You want to show up to those sessions. You want to have purpose in those training sessions, isn't it? It's not about driving it out. You have to show, show purpose. And, and so if it means that you go easier on that day, then fine. Maybe you're going to go slightly harder once you've recovered onto that next session. You've got to be adaptable. So let's talk about your triathlon then. Yes. So you, you, you're you not here by accident. You, yeah. you're, you're interested in triathlon. Obsessed. Yeah. Obsessed. Okay, obsessed with triathlon. So tell me about your triathlon experience or journey then so far. Yeah, so like my fitness journey... Um, started by being sort of motivated by my wife, who was a runner at, a t at the time. Um, I'd just been diagnosed with fatty liver disease, which at the age of 26, 27 was just awful. And it kind of was a wake up call. So my father has the same condition. And if you allow it to continue, you go into liver failure. 
me, my father's got liver failure and to see quality of life that he leads, that was the wake up call. It's like, you've got to do something about it. Also felt embarrassed as a doctor to have a condition which was caused by sort of increased weight. Like that was kind of the, my realization to want to go into lifestyle medicine. So sort of try and learn more about it. Do you want me asking what your weight, what weight you got to? Yeah. So 94 kilos. Okay. You're a kilo or stone man, hopefully a kilo, but at 94 yeah. kilos and I'm now 72. So a huge amount of weight was lost. And that wasn't lost in some kind of special six week or three month or six month thing. Those never worked. Okay. It was lost through very slow and gradual decline at about six or seven years. And the first thing I did was my wife just persuaded us to go for a run. I didn't have any trainers. I had owned trainers since I was in school. And even then I was the last person to be picked in school because I was generally awful at most things. And I went for a run. What really surprised me, my, you've met my wife. You know, she's a very petite, five foot three. And in my head, I always thought that if I had to, I could run faster. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Within like 200 meters, I couldn't keep up with her. And she was moving slowly for me. Like she wasn't even just running at her pace. And I was like, wow. Like I can't run the 200 meters without stopping. How long ago was this? How long ago are we talking? It is about eight and a half years ago. Okay. Yeah. Eight and a half years ago. And I started to build a little bit. We managed to get to about a kilometer without stopping. We just did the walk run. It's kind of like a loose couch to 5k. I wasn't following couch to 5k properly, but she was guiding me. And then what really kind of set me to the next level was going to park run. I went to park run at Leamington. And I uh, was invited by some of my colleagues that, 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 that work here in Len. And I just couldn't believe where I was physiologically compared to everyone else. I had people in their 70s overtaking me. I had a dying with a double prayer. <laughs> <had two> <laughs> Breeze past me like I wasn't there. And so then I was like, okay, do you know what? 5K, let's just focus on trying to get to a 5K without stopping. And that took uh, maybe two, three months, I got to the point where I could do a 5k, I was stopping, you know, I was probably in maybe 30 minutes, stuff like that, I, I wouldn't look at the time, because it was too painful, and I also did the scan, that's how like grad I was in a park road, I was unknown, you know, on the park road. Oh, you didn't scan? I didn't scan, Okay. because I just had such shame, <laughs> I didn't want my patients seeing, going, oh my god, look at Dr. Hussain, like he's, he's so slow, but that's the wrong mentality, and now I try to encourage people to put it over there, and that's what I should have done, and just, I just, focus I was like I can I get a little bit better and I try and do a little bit more a little bit more etc and eventually I got to a point where I was more comfortable running a 5k I think I've got to around 23 minutes that kind of thing and at that point my wife was kind of escalating her own activity and she had signed up to a marathon mm. and a marathon just felt like crazy talk because at the moment I've been overcoming my marathon which was do a 5k that stuff it and I watched her do the marathon. She did the Thames Meander marathon. It's not a very big one, but you just sort of follow the Thames out and back. And I kind of ran the last 5K with her. It was very open. There was no like closed roads or anything like that. And just to see the strength that she was showing in this final 5K, I'm actually getting a little bit serious to be with, um, was just ridiculous because I sport, you know, she's gone through so much pain and so much work. I've seen her training for months on end all for even more pain to go to the finish line. And I was just like, what are these crazy people? Like, how are they enjoying this so much? Because she, she was like begging for it to stop, but did want it to stop. So I was like, I've got to find out what it, what is it that they are doing? It's giving them this much joy. I started doing a bit more. I started running and I got my first half marathon and that was incredible. And I'm pretty sure that everyone else has done a half marathon. You get to the finish line, you go, how the hell am I going to do a marathon? Well, I kept going, and I managed to do, I'd say about a year later, I did my first marathon, um, and it was not pretty. It was about four hours 20, um, and it was extremely painful. But it just, as soon as I crossed that line, I was like, you're doing another one. You know, you're doing another one. And I just keep going from there, and you just keep building, building, building. I got fast at the marathon, and then, of course, in... My wife drags me onto all these things. My wife was like, oh, do you know what? I'd love to learn to cycle properly. I've never done cycling. 
Uh, so she started cycling with some of the sportifs around here, like the charity rides. Um, and we both couldn't swim. But she one day just said, what? I, I want to do an Ironman. And that's where you're just like, oh, yeah. Just because I knew that wherever she goes, I end up going. So I was like, oh, my God. An Ironman. And it just felt impossible because I didn't even know how to swim, let alone do an Ironman. And I remember I went to the swimming pool. I was like, okay, let's give this a go. Couldn't get more than a third of the way through a 25 minute pool without having to like gasp for breath and be like, oh, I can't, can't keep going. Um, and then hence, just had to send practice in YouTube videos, tips from people that <laughs> have pity on us in the pool and just look at us drowning. And you just keep going. And I think what's so important is that looking back on it now, People often think that, oh, you know, once I get to this time, I'll, you know, I'll be really happy and 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 and, and content in my triathlon, etc. Do you want know, be happy and content from day one? Like it's a journey. Like now, I look back on it, I enjoyed every day, even when I was a ridiculously slow swimmer and and a poor cyclist and and a slow runner. I still enjoyed it just as much as now when I'm doing 16 minute 5Ks, where you know I can I can happily I've got an FTP of 330, 335, where. Before, if my FTP was even above 100, like I was, I was pleased. Um, and it was just that process. It took years. Like these things don't happen over days and weeks, but it's just consistency, building it up slowly, working on the rest, trying to get the nutrition right, and learning as you go along. And what I love about triathlon is just it's such an awesome community, and they're always so helpful. Like when I turned up to my sort of first ever triathlon, you know, everyone could tell that I was a beginner and, and I was prime my way, but even when it was came to racking up the bike, to sorting out your stuff, like there's always someone to help out. Yeah. And to sort of give you tips and give you advice, support you through it. Recommend enough getting that support through the process, whether it be coaching you through the workouts or through how you set yourself up. Because it just makes it a more enjoyable experience than, you know, wandering around working out, how to do that, what are you supposed to do that? What's the rule for this? It just makes it easier, reduces the friction, as we said before. So now, like, doing an Ironman, it's, for me, it's a way of life. It's that appreciation that you're going to just work that bit harder each day. And I apply the same things I've learned in completing an Ironman to my work project, to my friendships, to my other social activities. You know, being an Ironman isn't about crossing that line. It's that sort of mentality you take to make so each day count. In whatever it is you're doing, it doesn't have to be a workout. It could be making it count by having a proper, meaningful conversation with your partner. It could be making it count by going to work and supporting those around you. It's those things. I think that's what sold it to me for Iron Man. You know, that it was just that kind of, it's such a huge feat. It's such an achievement. Just training to do one, in my book, you've achieved the vast majority of them. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we uh, quite frequently say that to that to people. In fact, it's got, it's got athletes, got uh, got Ironman coming up soon. And it's, you know, it's their first one. Um, and, you know, I said, you've done, you've done 99% of the work. You know, just doing the Ironman at the end, if you look at the whole journey, is, is, a, is a tiny little part of it. You know, you should, you should be proud regardless. In fact, I've had a couple of athletes who haven't, haven't made it to the finish line for, for various reasons. But you still be proud of yourself because look what you've achieved. Not many people could do that. Not many people will have the, to get to that start line yeah the fact that you have put yourself on the line on that start line that's a huge huge yeah. leap yeah you know this is an iron man i don't think people just often they kind of belittle it once they do it but when you tell people what an iron man is you get the same response mm. that is complete utter shock you tell them about the swim they're like oh my god you say the bike they're like what and then by that point, they've already kind of like their mind's blown. Then you have to then wait for them to sort of recover. And you go, and now a marathon. You know, like it's it's out of this world. You know, if you don't get to the end, that does not matter. What I would say is that it's not the end of your journey. You have to keep going. Drive it. And that comes on to another topic that I get a lot with patients that are keen. Let's say they do activities. Maybe they've run a marathon or a 10K or an Iron Man. That finish line that is not the finish because if it is you'll get this sort of feeling of disappointment and deflation for the week afterwards uh -huh. 
because then you kind of got well my purpose is gone yeah get that all the time athletes yeah blue. you know the blues aren't at the best it's never the end and you have to think about it as a continual journey maybe you've got iron man barcelona on this day you now need to decide even before you finish that event what's next you know what have you got coming up and it doesn't have to be an iron man like it can be a 10k or a trail run or or a swim that you want to do whatever it is and it's including physicality a little timeline a roadmap you always need to be doing these things because what I hate is speaking to patients that say, oh, yeah, 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 I did an Ironman 15 years ago, but then they don't do anything now. Because that, that you, you've removed the benefit of what that Ironman was supposed to be. That was supposed to be you developing a certain kind of lifestyle and, and trends that was going to put you in good stead for the rest of your life. So you, it may be that you very much lower the volume. It may be that you lower the intensity that you do. That's fine, but have a plan. Have a plan and new goals, and new purpose, because the worst thing in the world is after all the effort to have two, three days later and be a bit, oh, you know, I was expecting some kind of weird, like Superman feeling to now yeah. go for, for forever and ever. It's yeah. not going to happen. You yeah, can't. I mean, I see that all the time with athletes and I, I warn them, I pre prepare them, say you will kind of almost go into a bit of a mental hole afterwards, unless you've got something planned longer term, because... You know, you're super high, aren't you? The whole event and you, you, you've been, you've been building up to this thing for so long and then you've done it. And then now what you end up in a, you end up in a, in a hole, which you need to try and climb out of. And we get the same thing with training camps. Actually, when people go away on training camps, they're high on life for a week or two weeks, how long they're away for, they come back as I like, oh. And I say, prepare yourself. When you get back, you always, you will feel a little bit low. And you need to have something to bring you back out of that. Another target or a goal of some description. Really important. So the power that purpose has to keeping up habits, is it's undeniable. And you have to build that in. And I would say, don't start planning after the Ironman, long before. Mm. You need to kind of, I've always got probably the next six months of what I want to try and achieve mm. from a physical activity perspective, all laid out. It's rolling. So... Like, it's, I, in fact, I, met, I did Ironman Court, it was two weeks ago, mm. and I was even thinking about it in the last 10K. I was thinking about, oh, those are the next things that I was doing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was already in my mind where my next goals and purpose was. Uh, I was going to get back into training once I'd allowed my body to recover the amount of time, but the motivation's there, mm. and it means that you can drag that high and instead allow it to sort of peter off naturally take it on continually rather than allowing that high then suddenly dive down that you've got nothing to bring you back to equilibrium because you had not got anything planned so you've lost your purpose why are you going to get on the bike why are you going to get in the pool again yeah keep it there keep it there and it's so much more fun when you've got that journey doing it and another tip i'd say is try and do these events with other people yeah for sure i love doing it with my friends i love doing it with colleagues and family a because of people that I've also encouraged and inspired to move in the same way my wife did for me that's a great feeling when I sit down I think wow like I remember one of my friends that literally told me he said to my face like I will never do a marathon okay never like don't even tell me to do one and I never told him but what I would do is I would just subtly say that oh do you want to go to Iceland I'm doing the marathon but do you want to just come to Iceland and in the end he did the Reykjavik marathon um, with me and so like often it's not about telling people what to do just invite them. Invite them, and then if you invite them enough times, they'll just be inspired to want to come along on that journey. So, yeah, do it with others, because that also gives you another reason to do it. And that makes sense, because if you start off oh, with Ian, I'm going to go and do Reykjavik Marathon, you kind of already kind of fill it in, because mm -hmm. you can't let Ian down. Yeah. So, <laughs> for sure, about planning ahead, doing things with other people, and kind of combine it like there's no reason why traffic can't be a way that you can have a holiday as well there's so many beautiful places in the world that do travel it's a great way to visit a country yeah it sure is that's totally and so and what i've also loved is seeing how people take on travel in different countries it's been fascinating see how people really you know interact with it and their sort of their um, motivation and joy for it it's just awesome. So where's your, where's your, what's your motivation within the sport then? Are you trying to, because I know you've raced uh, for GB as an age group, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. So is that, is that your, is that your ultimate goal to keep on doing that? Or what's your, what would you like to achieve? Initially it was just the end without dying. And then it became, you know, 
hit certain time goals that I had set myself. And I'd run an Ironman way of 70.2. And I realized when I sort of crossed the line, I was like, oh, actually, wait a minute. I wasn't that far behind the winner in my age group. That's why I then frantically went online. So I was like, I knew the age group had a certain like cutoff percentage. What was it? I'm just working it out in the sort of finishes head that you have afterwards. Uh, and I realized, oh, I was in it and then quite and, and comfortably so. And so, yeah, represented Team GB at Ibiza World Champs this year. Um, and that was just such an incredible experience. Just made me think back, you know, it wasn't long ago that I was a 94 kilo guy being told that you've got fatty liver disease. If you don't reverse this, then you're going to have to have a liver transplant at some point. Um, to have been fit enough to be considered, you know, good enough to put on a Team GB yeah. Yeah. Um, a try suit on. I just blew my mind when I was yeah, before the swim. I was like, "What are you doing here?" Do you know what I mean? You're the kid that would never be picked at school because they didn't want to lose. Um, anyway, but but so my ambitions at the moment is just about trying to optimize what I can do, and I know there's going to come a point where I'm not going to go faster in a half Ironman or an Ironman or a marathon for that matter. I don't think that day's here yet. I hope not. All I can do is just maximize everything. And I won't mind once I start going slower because then I'll change my perspective. It'll be about maintaining. It'll be about maintaining performance. Um, and the other beautiful thing I like about triathlon is that it's all age group. So if yeah. you do like that competition, just focus on using the yardstick of other people in your age. Don't look at the 20-year-olds the and, and early 30-year-olds. Focus on your age group. Show that you can maintain your performance and work on that. So... At the moment, it's just about learning. It's just about trying to hone the skills. And that's the bit I love. That's the truly the bit I love is about, you know, seeing how far you can push your performance while enjoying it at the same time. Because I think if you don't enjoy the workouts for what they are, regardless of what they're going to give you or your performance, you're not going to last long. If you don't enjoy those rides, if you don't enjoy the swims, it's a bit becomes a chore that for sure if you've got lots of motivation you could probably grind out but i love them like i, I would honestly say there's there's no workout that i finished and gone oh no that was rubbish you know and so i will make sure that first and foremost i enjoy it and if let's say i'm not feeling it that day i'll just tone down the intensity i'll make yourself feel bad like maybe i had a you know a trainer a thing on the what bike that i was supposed to hit and i was supposed to do an interval session if I'm really knackered because I had to work really hard the day before, I'm just going to go for a more casual 50k ride out of the Warwickshire countryside. Because I think what's important for age groupers is just to remember, first and foremost, enjoy it. You know, because we spend a lot of time doing these things. It's a lot of hours in the week. Lots of people take it too seriously. They get, you they get. Both. Yeah. You can do both. You can have sort of like a seriousness to try and compete, but also. If you actually really want to squeeze out all the benefits, in my opinion, to keep making it fun. No, absolutely. That's the key to the longevity in pro yeah. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And particularly, I think about swimming when you say things like that, because lots of uh, lots of triathletes struggle with swimming. That's mm -hmm. that particular yeah. component part. Therefore, they don't go. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I spent some time, um, I was mentored as a coach by Brett Sutton. I'm not sure if you know of, mm -hmm. of Brett, but, Brett, but he's... He's um, probably one of the most successful, or almost certainly is the most successful triathlon coach in the history of the sport in terms of professional sport. Um, I went to a, a, a Switzerland, actually, Sam Moritz, and he was he was doing a talk to some athletes. I was there as a coach, uh, and he was saying, you know, rule number one with swimming is to enjoy being there, is to want to be there. And as a coach, you've got to get your athletes to want to be there. It doesn't matter what it takes. Not so much the training, um, and the physical, the technical aspects, they've just got to want to be in the pool because if they don't want to be there, they won't get there. They won't go. And if they don't go, they won't improve. So that means using things like music. If you know, if you want to use your MP3 player or if you want to use your pool boy or your buoyancy shorts or whatever it is that you want to do to make you enjoy it, do it. Because otherwise, you ain't going to go. Uh, and swimming is a, is a volume-based sport. You've got to put the work in. Um, so it's it's absolutely enjoy what you do. Yeah, yeah, like it. And 
And because it's again back to that friction thing that I often try to get people to think if, if you make swimming more enjoyable, you're reducing the friction to doing the activity. For sure, out of the three, it's, it's swimming is the one I find the hardest. And, and previously, I used to have the struggle the most getting motivated to do a session. Uh, one trick that I did with my wife was we sort of feel around swimming kind of like a social activity. So we said, look, whenever we go swimming, we'll go out for, you know, coffee. Uh, and then something nice to eat. So that's what we do, whether we go to the pool and we go to the nearby cafe afterwards, or when we go to Quantum Bernie at, at, at your location, um, you know, it's lovely cake and, 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 and a warm drink there. And so that's kind of something just to motivate yourself. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. Building in that routine of going, okay, I'll go swimming. Oh, but the nice thing about it is that it's such a beautiful surroundings, Quantum Bernie, I'm going to have something nice to have, a treat at the end of the day. Do it, build it in. If that helps you get there, yeah. and then because invariably, whenever I've actually started swimming, I enjoy it. Sometimes it can be a little demotivating because not getting the progress you are in the other sports. It's not one of those things where you can just put effort in, you get results. You kind of need to know what you're yeah. doing. So you kind of just keep splashing around, expecting to go faster in a straight line. Um, so I think it's really important that people build in those little bits to make it less friction. So therefore, you're more likely to turn up because you, you need to put in the work. You can't expect to ever catch up on your other disciplines if you're not putting, in fact, more time and effort into swimming. Like You can never expect to catch up. So where's your strength then? Where would you say your strength is? Well, it used to be running because that's kind of where I came in from. Uh, I'd definitely say it's probably the bike now. It, okay. It's my, my main strength. Particular, I'm very good on hills. Just the power to weight ratio is very good. Um, and, and so I say, sort of cycling is probably my greatest strength. Um, generally in a sort of Ironman events, I probably underperform on the bike purposefully in order to give myself that, that sort of power on the run. Um, so I kind of like overtrain in the bike. So therefore when I finish that bike, I'm still pretty good. I'm still ready to punch out a good, uh, good run. Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult, those tactics, because once I did try to go and just smash the bike and I smashed the bike and I was like, wow, like I am on for a massive PB. I could have had like a, I could have run the marathon. So it was actually cascades. So like my marathon in an Ironman is generally about 310, 350 is what I've done before. That's it. Port 70.2, I managed to pull out a 124 half. Like how I did that, I don't know. That, that blew my mind. But anyway, so I, I can have a good marathon time and I, I got to the end of transition two and I was like do you know what I could do a 345 and I'm still gonna PB I was so confident I was like this is gonna go amazing and then the over exuberance in the bike led to me absolutely dying I walked the last 20k it was it was so infuriating just watching the time and you want to run them you're gone I was vomiting all over the place just totally exhausted <laughs> so, so I definitely didn't pace the bike as well as I could. Um, so now I probably am overcautious. So I need to find a middle point. It's very hard to work out what is the perfect bike time effort uh, in order to give me the optimal kind of run effort. Because obviously you can gain more time on the bike than you can on the run for effort. Mm. But but things can go disastrously wrong on the run, can't they? They can. They can, they can go backwards. I, I've um, I've done uh, I've done a few shockers like that. I uh, I did Ironman Lanzarote many years ago, and uh, did a did a, an okay bike time for Lanzarote because it's not the easiest bike course in the world. Ironman Lanzarote, and I blew after mile one of the of the marathon. Can you imagine? It was. I can still remember what I thought. I can still remember that sensation now. Thinking, I've got twenty five miles. I'm I'm. At the wall already, 25 miles to go, and it's hot, it's windy, and it's back and forth. It's just soul-destroying. But, you know, you get through it. You can't regain it. Like, no. You can only endure it. It's not like, oh, if you walk for five miles, suddenly you're going to feel better. Mm. That, you need, like, a lie down, a lot about eight hours of rest. <laughs> yeah, 25 miles is going to feel like a yeah. hundred, probably. It was, was, that was when I was young and didn't know any better. <laughs> But I did. I can't remember what I did actually. It was probably five hours or something in the end because it was mostly walking and the occasional jog. Um, but uh, and I was probably in, I don't know, three hour, twenty three hour, thirty running shape. 
you know, really then. So you can go badly wrong. <laughs> it can go badly wrong. <laughs> It's like I finished the bike, despite you like really doing a really fast time for me, massive PB. I felt good, but it's just like often you can't quite like True. really assess where you are, in particular from a energy perspective in nutrition. The one thing I was struggling to do on the bike was get much food down. Yeah, uh, and that was a difficult balance, isn't it? Because if you're overexerting, then your ability to consume and absorb starts to drop off, and as soon as I started running and I was moving, I could feel that my stomach was full. Like it had gone into what we call gastroparesis. So like it's the stomach, just the natural movement slowed out. And it's not such a big issue on the bike in terms of noticing it. But on the run, suddenly you do because your requirements go up. And so that's why I sort of, I learned future ones, getting that nutrition right and actually training with nutrition. And up until that point, I would just go on a ride and, you know, have whatever bars or whatever was there. Um, and I wouldn't simulate what I would be fueling myself. Yeah. You've got to, because going for a long ride with your mates, yeah, you're going to be able to consume stuff, no problem, because you're not going to be at the effort you do it. But doing, let's say, your, you know, close to your sort of optimal power over that distance and consuming is really tricky. So... I generally just, I, I drop it off a bit on the performance element so I can get a bit more nutrition in and then I can do a stronger heart. You just, oh, I always enjoy the trap of more if you attack all of it, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. rather than dragging yourself over the last five games. Which don't get me wrong, that's what you end up doing. I've done that many times. That's totally fine. You get to the finish line whichever way you can. Mm -hmm. But I think pacing is just so important. Oh, massive. Are you coached? Do you, or are you self-coached? Self-coached. Okay. Self-coached. I, I, Try my best to look at a lot of stuff online. Um, it's definitely something that I'm looking at doing. Before, like I didn't, I didn't get a coach just because my life was just so like erratic from a job perspective. Like the, I have so many different roles, I'm constantly traveling around. But now that I've sort of spoken to a few other athletes, probably I need it more than, than others do because I need to find a way to, despite this irregularity in my working week, I need to find a way to make it optimum. So it's something I'm considering. Do you, um, do you record it all on a training platform or anything like that? So you have your data to look at oh, yeah, and you've got data. power meters and heart rate monitors and all that. So you've got all the information that you need. In a way, it kind of fits into my role as a lifestyle medic where, yes, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not working with athletes, athletes. I still call them athletes, but I'm trying to optimize everything that they've got, maybe from a lower baseline. I still treat myself exactly the same. You know, like I, it's really important to look at that data, not to become obsessed in the sense of, making it demotivate you but more just to think look you know where can i improve you know where's where's the weak spots where's the bits i can get stronger get better uh and i i find a lot of fun in that a lot of the fun a lot of fun in analyzing that data and sort of getting a bit scientific about it you know it'd be just have a look it'd be interesting to have a look at your data if you if you uh if you're running because you would you say 320 what did you say your ft yeah ft three, three, five. Three, three, five, and you weight what 72 kilos 72 kilos Okay, so you've got a good power to weight there. Yeah, yeah, really good power to weight. Like, you notice it most on the inclines. Like, in every yeah. Ironman event, as soon as there's an incline, yeah. the difference is shocking. But, like, on the flat, some of the big guys can, like, generate some ridiculous speed yeah. that I'm just trying to cling on to. But then, like, in Cork, the last half is um, is, is quite uphill. And they have Windmill Hill. If anyone wants to do Cork Ironman, Windmill Hill is ridiculous. 25% elevation. <laughs> and... Wow, like it's it's it honestly is like Tour de France. Like the amount of um, spectators on the road is insane. The sort of path you can cycle is generally this narrow, not because the road's that narrow, but there's so many people and they're screaming into your ear. Like that was that was by far away the most incredible cycling experience I've ever had. Just doing that stretch uphill, my quads felt like they were going to explode, but like you, I had never felt so much energy. Um, from the crowd, but yeah, no, definitely climbing is is my sort. Of, probably my so you would you would suit a course like Lanzarote then, where it's a it's a it's a, a lot of climbing, but with a flat run. Yes. So that, that would be, be that would be yeah. So there we go, May yeah. May next May next year. Well, Doctor Hussain, thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate uh, giving us your yeah your time today. Uh, I think we covered some really interesting points there. So. To summarize, I'm going to try and remember some of the things we've spoken about now. Basically, or well, the biggest one takeaway I've got is use it or use it, use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. Um, and the menopause side of things is really, really interesting, both on the male side and the female side. So that's certainly some things we'll 
or take away. Um, but well done on your triathlon. Well done on your TV TV career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. And, and like, I just, I think the best thing about the triathlon community is that growth mindset. And at certain form, whether you've taken a break, whether maybe you've dipped in performance, doesn't matter. Just reframe it. Reframe yeah. it. Don't focus on what you used to do. Just focus on doing a bit better than the day before. And that a bit better doesn't have to mean going faster. Because there'll be, for many athletes, particularly those over 50, they will not be faster than they used to. They're not going to break their PBs anymore. But instead, it's about focusing on the performance at that point. Because I promise you, if you just maximize what you can do, when it comes to 70, 80, and you look around and compare yourself to your friends, you'll be streets apart streets apart and you'll be able to actually enjoy life for much longer well i hope you enjoyed that interview with dr hussein and we'll take away some thoughts that will help you improve your well-being feel free to leave us any comments or questions you may have and we'll try and get through those as soon as we can and if you're interested in finding out more about our triathlon training plans i'll add some links down below now, in the next episode, we speak to professional triathlete Megan McDonald. Now, Megan has been a pro for just over a year and is finding her feet in the elite level of middle distance triathlon. But she's been racing and training and preparing for this since she was a child. Now, this is a great listen for anyone interested in triathlon, particularly those who would like to know what it's like to be a professional athlete. Subscribe and be notified when the next episode uploads. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.